Hello everyone, in this video we'll talk about pancreas and this is an overview of pancreas, the anatomy and physiology but in subsequent videos we would go into the details but in this video we would learn the very basic the function of pancreas, the endocrine and exocrine part. So let's begin. So pancreas is situated just behind the liver and pancreas is a heterocrine gland. That means pancreas would have a exocrine part and also a endocrine part. If we look at the pancreas, it is uh, anatomically divided into few locations such as the acini, head, neck, body and the tail. The tail of the pancreas touches the spleen whereas the head and the acinar part is uh, towards the arch of the duodenum. And just above the pancreas, there would be liver, gallbladder, etc. Now let us look at uh, the pancreatic structure. Now inside the pancreas, there are a lot of uh, enzyme-filled regions, which are known as acini. And from there, the enzymes would be dripping off into a main uh, outlet, which is known as the pancreatic duct, which meets the common bile duct coming from the gallbladder. And the liver and ultimately it opens into the duodenum via the ampulla of butter. So this is the overall anatomy by which pancreatic secretions can go and enter the duodenum. Now inside the pancreas there are two broad sub regions. This region is the endocrine and the other regions which are forming spe specialized duct-like structures coming from these uh, glandular cells. These are known as exocrine part of the pancreas. So let us first talk about the exocrine pancreas, its function, and then we would move on to understand the endocrine uh, pancreas. Now in the exocrine pancreas, there are acinar cells and the duct cells. These acinar cells, if we zoom into it, we would see a lot of zymogen granules. So these zymogen granules are nothing but all secretory enzymes which are inside, in, inside the vesicles. Now these vesicles need trigger to be released into this lumen. And we would learn about the trigger factors shortly. Now the pancreatic juice, which is drained down these acinar cells to the acini is actually 98% water and other part is generally enzyme and bicarbonate and the bicarbonate makes it quite a lot of alkaline. Now here there would be several enzymes which are secreted such as pancreatic amylase, pancreatic lipase, phospholipase, trypsinogen, chymotrypsin, in a, a chymotrypsinogen format, etc. So all major protein digesting enzymes are secreted in a primitive format or inactivated format, which further gets activated once it reaches the intestine. Now let us look at the pancreas in a bit more detail. So here you can see uh, the acini and from there, there would be digestive enzymes secreted and would be moving through this uh, pathway and it would reach the intestine. Now there would be innervation of the blood vessels and these blood vessels collect the pancreatic hormones from the endocrine part and that acts on several parts of the GI tract or many other parts as well. So the hormone is secreted from these endocrine part and that is carried by the blood. So the major hormones that are secreted from the pancreas is insulin, glucagon, somatostatin, and pancreatic polypeptide. Now let's talk about the phases of the pancreatic juice secretion. So the first phase of pancreatic juice secretion is nothing but the cephalic phase, which is modulated by the vagus nerve. You can see there are vagus nerve innervation in the stomach and the pancreas. Now, whenever uh, there would be some kind of food in the mouth or smell, etc., that would stimulate the vagus nerve and vagus nerve would release its content on stomach and <coughs> pancreas. 
Now, as a result, pancreas would secrete some amount of pancreatic juice and it tells the intestine to get prepared for what is coming down from the stomach. So that is the cephalic phase. After that, there is a gastric phase. In this gastric phase, the presence of food in the stomach modulates uh, the further activities in this phase. And this phase, unlike the cephalic phase, is modulated by hormones such as gastrin, which leads to secretion of enzyme-rich pancreatic juice. But only 20% of it is released by gastrin alone. Now, later on, in the intestinal phase, when the chyme is moving down to the intestine from the uh, stomach, it leads to secretion of CCK, cholecystokinin, and secretin, which leads to two things. One, secretion of enzyme-rich pancreatic juice. 80% of the pancreatic juice is secreted in this phase. And it leads to secretion of bicarbonate-rich pancreatic juice, so which makes the pancreatic secretion a bit more alkaline. So at least at a molecular level, three factors are governing pancreatic secretion or pancreatic uh, exocrine pancreatic activity. Those are acetylcholine, which are secreted from the vagus nerve and acetylcholine receptors present in the uh, pancreas respond to that. After that, there would be secretin, which is also secreted by duodenal and jejunal mucosa. And it really uh, helps in bicarbonate secretion and also secretion of the pancreatic juice. And lastly, cholecystokinin, which generally helps in pancreatic secretion and also it has other effects on the gallbladder contraction. So overall, it helps in the digestion process in several ways. So I have a separate video on cholecystokinin. You can watch it. Now let's look at the molecular level. So secretin is nothing but a peptide type hormone. Secretin binds to the G protein coupled receptor present in the acinar cell. And this signaling ultimately leads to sodium ion and bicarbonate ion secretion into the lumen. Later on, cholecystokinin also binds to its receptor present on the acinar cells. Cholecystokinin helps in the digestive enzyme secretion. Actually, cholecystokinin mediated signaling elevates calcium inside the cell, which ultimately leads to the zymogen granule filled up with enzymes to be secreted into the lumen. So this is how at a molecular level, we understand how pancreatic secretion is regulated by hormonal and neuronal uh, ways. So then we talk about endocrine pancreas. So endocrine pancreas means the portion of the pancreas that secretes hormone. And if we look at the endocrine pancreas, there would be alpha cells, there would be delta cells, there would be beta cells. And all of these different cell types secrete different hormones. And we would get to know about it very soon. So first question is how pancreatic beta cell secretes insulin. So let me tell you that pancreatic beta cell is the source of insulin, whereas the alpha cells are a uh, source of uh, glucagon, delta cells are source of somatostatin. Now let's talk about how beta cells secrete insulin. So whenever there is a blood glucose level increase, insulin level is high. So pancreatic beta cell has insulin gene and this insulin gene gets transcribed and translated which ultimately forms the insulin. And this insulin is stored in format of pro-insulin in secretory vesicles. And it is waiting for some trigger to be released. Now, when there is some trigger, that means presence of glucose in the bloodstream after a meal, then what happens? These glucose enters these uh, beta cells via GLUT2 transporter. Now, these beta cells, when the glucose level is low, they remain in a hyperpolarized state. So, vesicles cannot really be released at this state. But when glucose level is high after a meal, then these beta cells goes in the depolarized state and it augments 
it augments the vesicle fusion and thereby releasing of uh, insulin. So the glucose that comes in forms glucose 6-phosphate eventually forms the glycolysis and ultimately it gives rise to ATP. This ATP actually blocks few leak potassium channels. As this leakage is blocked, now the internal membrane would be more positive, more depolarized, which would be proper for vesicle fusion and release the content into the environment. Ultimately, insulin is secreted in response to high blood glucose level. Now, apart from insulin secretion, there are other cell types, right? Such as pancreatic alpha cells. Pancreatic alpha cells give rise to glucagon, whereas beta cells give rise to insulin. Now, insulin and glucagon turns out to be pretty much antagonistic to each other and they work in a fashion, work in an opposite fashion. And their activity, their function are modulated by glucose concentration. For example, when glucose level is high, insulin is secreted. Whereas when glucose level is low, glucagon is secreted. Now let's talk about what really, uh, what functions really glucagon and insulin carry out. And it's a very brief but specific overview. So if we talk about glucagon and insulin, they modulate several metabolic pathways. And the major, majority of them is the glucose metabolizing pathway. So the glycolysis has opposing effect uh, modulated by glycogen or uh, glucagon or insulin. So glycolysis is augmented by glucagon whereas inhibited by uh, insulin. Then glycogenolysis is augmented by glucagon whereas inhibited by insulin. Glycogenesis is inhibited by glucagon whereas augmented by uh, insulin. Whereas when it comes to gluconeogenesis, insulin prevents gluconeogenesis, but glucagon promotes gluconeogenesis. So this is how we understand that insulin and glucagon are working in an opposing fashion. Not only in case of glucose metabolism, but in case of fat metabolism as well, insulin and glucagon work in an opposing manner. So let us talk about the blood glucose level again, so it would help us to understand. Under high blood glucose level, we would have a lot of insulin, right? And in that state, we know that there are enzymes in the cytoplasm of cells which would convert acetyl-CoA into malonyl-CoA, the rate-limiting step for fatty acid biosynthesis. Now, acetyl-CoA is carboxylated by acetyl-CoA carboxylase enzyme, which exists in two states. Uh, active state which is dephosphorylated and an inactive state which is phosphorylated. Now this dephosphorylation, so from this phosphorylated to dephosphorylated state is actually modulated by phosphatase enzyme and the opposite step is modulated by kinase enzyme. Now when the glucose level is high, insulin actually acts on these phosphatase enzyme. Insulin positively regulate phosphatase enzymes and thereby activate acetyl-CoA carboxylase. Now as insulin in, in an indirect fashion activates acetyl-CoA carboxylase, it augments the fatty acid biosynthesis process. So moral of the story is insulin helps in the fatty acid biosynthesis. Now we talk about a situation where the glucose level is low. Now, in this low blood glucose level situation, glucagon level would be high and glucagon activates specific kinase enzymes. And these kinase enzyme phosphorylates acetyl-CoA carboxylase and ultimately inactivates this particular carboxylase enzyme. As a result, fatty acid biosynthesis cannot take place inside the cytoplasm. So, in short, we understood that glucagon prevents fatty acid biosynthesis whereas insulin augments fatty acid biosynthesis. So how these pancreatic enzymes are modulating a biosynthetic pathway in an opposite manner. It's like a switch. Now we won't talk about much, uh, much about the somatostatin in this video. Later we would have a separate video on that. But let us summarize what we have learned so far. 
we learned the general anatomy and the physiology of pancreas we learned the location subdivisions etc then we learned about the exocrine part of the pancreas which secretes digestive enzymes and then we talked about uh, uh, hormones which are secreted from the pancreas the endocrine part of the pancreas especially we talked about insulin and glucagon and their functions in controlling metabolism so i hope you enjoyed this video and this video was informative enough if you like this video give it a quick thumbs up don't forget to like share and subscribe you can also join my unacademy course by using my code ap10 you would get a 10% discount if you like this video do let me know in the comment uh, if you need any improvement or if you have any other suggestions and thanks for listening stay tuned for more